ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's, uh, let's get on. We're going to turn now and talk about change in the species. Medicine is in the midst of a revolution, advances in the field of genomics in particular, creating unprecedented opportunities to study human biology, evolution, and disease. And these tools are making it uh, possible to better understand pathogens like Lhasa, Ebola, and Zika. They, um, this is also a way to develop new ways to investigate natural selection in the human genome and to better understand genomics and its relationship to public health. Uh, it's fascinating stuff, and, and you get the sense that it's changing so rapidly it's hard to keep up. Our speaker is a professor at Harvard and at the Broad Institute of Harvard at MIT. She is also a Howard Hughes investigator. Please welcome Dr. Pardis Sebedi. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, I'm going to be talking about evolutionary forces in humans and in pathogens. Um, and really, uh, the, the work I do, and I've been fascinated with ever since I started my graduate work, is really trying to figure out how we can leverage evolution to try to understand biology. And this actually is a, is a long time uh, sort of enterprise. Uh, Darwin and Wallace, uh, back in the latter, in the 1858, first set forth the principles of natural selection that really set forth the idea that not only organisms on Earth, but soon after thinking about humans as well as, as species that are evolving over time. But it wasn't until sometime in the 20th century where we had our first example of human evolution. And this is when uh, J.B.S. Haldane made a simple observation of the natural world. He noted that there are many red blood cell disorders and that they happen to be occurring, many of them in, in tropical regions of the world where malaria is endemic. And knowing that malaria infects red blood cells, hypothesized that perhaps somehow it had risen to prevalence because it conferred an adaptive advantage uh, to malaria. And in fact, just a few years later, A.C. Allison showed that. He showed individuals who carry the sickle cell trait are protected from malaria. And soon after, we began to understand many of the red blood cell disorders were also conferring that advantage. But now, actually, rather than make these very you know, beautiful and elegant but very painstaking observations of the natural world, we have data from the entire genome. And we can actually look at the data from the genome that's coming off from humans and other species, and we can identify footprints, footprints that occur when a new mutation emerges and spreads in the population. And they're often very large footprints, and we'll talk a little bit about them, uh, but we really are trying to pinpoint in on what genetic change occurred and what effect does it have. And what's fascinating is, you know, using DNA from just an indi from individuals living in the world today, we can take that and we can begin to see these patterns. And so we call this fossil-free archaeology. There's an archaeological record hidden in our own DNA that we can use to begin to understand the things that are biologically important. And that's really what I've been pursuing for many years, uh, uh, first uh, you know, through my graduate work and now in my lab. And the signal that, I, that my lab pursues is one of recent positive natural selection. So very specific, because uh, there's lots of different things you can look for. But this is essentially adaptation that happened in human populations within the last 10 to 50,000 years. And they're beneficial, somehow uh, you know, enhance our survival or reproductive success. And you imagine if a new mutation occurs, giving an individual an adaptive trait in a, in a so if we look here, in a set of individuals, a new, a new mutation occurs, giving someone that adaptive advantage, it will begin to spread through the population because that individual will survive, reproduce, pass it on to their children, and their children will survive, reproduce, and pass it on to their children's children. And what will happen is a new allele under positive selection will rise rapidly in prevalence in the population. But if we're looking now today, we can only look at the individuals living today, we're looking for those patterns. What we're looking for of a signal of a positively selected allele, a beneficial adaptive trait, is an allele that's at high prevalence that somehow got there in a very short period of time, i.e. it has a young age. And I'll just show you one of the types of signals that we look to find that. We can find these different kinds of signals in the genome. So um, I'm going to use a couple of terms here. So one of the things is typical variants, we call them alleles, mutations in the population, they usually uh, have been around for a long time, the ones that are common. And there's processes that generate diversity, like mutation and recombination, that reshuffle the background on which these things lie in the genome. And so what will happen is they'll begin to, when they occur, because they've been around so long, they're on many different backgrounds. And we call this a broken haplotype. The haplotype is the configuration of variants on a particular uh, part of the genome. And you see lots and lots of different breaks that occur. 
But imagine that in one of these individuals, a mutation occurred and it spread very, very quickly. It'll spread so quickly that there won't be enough time for that diversification, mutation, recombination, or reshuffle the background. So just want to give you a sense of the kinds of patterns that we're looking for in this vast genomic data is we look for something called a long haplotype, which is an allele that's you know, common in the population, but that doesn't have a lot of diversity on the background that it exists. And that's one of the signals that uh, my group looks at. And using these types of signals, we found hundreds and hundreds of signals of evolution in the genome, these giant footprints. The thing is, because of the fact that it moved so quickly, it became common so quickly, it took up that whole track of the genome with it. And so we can see these kinds of patterns like at lactose tolerance, this long and broken haplotype where all the variants on a stretch of the genome are all linked together. And so that makes it really easy to detect the signal, but then really hard to figure out what was the mutation that was the driver. Right? And so what we have now are these hundreds of signals of these long haplotypes and other types of patterns in the genome, but we've really gotten stuck as to figuring out what they do. The types of things that we, you know, were able to confirm are things like lactose tolerance, skin pigmentation, and malaria resistance as major drivers of human evolution. But what are all those other things doing? And that's a big question. And so, yeah, you know, the long haplotype is the type of approach that I worked on, but there are lots of different signals that you can look for. Another common one is just differences between populations. If evolution is acting, you know, in one environmental setting and not in another, you can see differences that emerge between populations. There's lots of these different kinds of signals we can tease out to detect natural selection acting. But one of the things I, I considered is, I, you know, I, I was in the long haplotype camp, but all of the signals are really interesting. Could we use the combined power of all these different tests to really localize in on who is the driver and who are all the people that are coming along for the ride. And I won't have time to go into the details, but I just want to show you what that looks like. These are the types of signals you see across stretches of the genome, and those are all the different variants. And you can see these places where you see this coarse signal, lots of mutations in the region, looking like there's something different going on there, but really hard to figure out where it comes from. When we combine the power of the different signals in something we call the composite of multiple signals, we're actually able to localize much better. This is a particular region in which a pigmentation gene is one of many genes within a million base stretch of the genome. And uh, actually, the signal localizes straight on top of this pigmentation gene, MAP-P, and an amino acid change within that gene. And so we can start to see on, on a number of cases that, that this is really beginning to localize. And as we go through the whole genome, we were able to really begin to see this on a larger scale. These are the core signals we had originally. This is what it's starting to come like. There's still multiple variants in the region, so there's still work to be done. But we can start to really pinpoint where it's selection happening and have a set of variants we can begin to pursue and to understand the drivers of evolution. I have to just give this one example, which is not about infectious disease, but Dan Lieberman is here, and he's my colleague. We've worked on this for a long time, and it's fascinating, the types of things you can find. So this is a signal selection we found in Asia, one of the strongest signals of selection in the genome, in this large stre stretch of the genome that localized in on an amino acid change in a gene called EDAR, ectodysplasin receptor. And ectodysplasin drives sort of formation of hair and sweat. And it, we, uh, uh, with Cliff Tabin and Bruce Morgan, Dan and I uh, came together and began to investigate this mutation. And we did, uh, created a mouse knock-in, actually Yana Kambroff and our group did, and was able to show that the mutation alone, that singular variant that was under selection, changed the diameter of hair, changed the, ma uh, changed the mammary glands, and also changed the number of sweat glands. Um, we could see that this mutation emerged in Asia about 30,000 years ago and is associated in human populations with the changes in the hair as well as this increase in, in sweat gland density. So we're starting to see thermoregulation as a possible driver of human evolution. But really, you know, my fascination is in immune and infectious disease. And one of the other signals that popped out was a signal that was strong in Africa but also present in lots of places in the world for toll-like receptor, which is an immune gene um, that's important in how we respond to flagellated bacteria. And so the signal selection in Africa localized to leucine alanine change in toll-like receptor 5. That was an important domain of the protein. And as it turns out, toll-like receptor 5 is important in how we respond to bacterial flagellin. It sort of, uh, it's a signal. It creates a cascade and, and, and creates a response system. We, what we did is we were able to create a system where we took that singular mutation and put it into cells and began to investigate how it would respond differently to flagellated bacteria with just that singular change. Um, and indeed, actually, the derived allele, which is the, the, the adaptive uh, allele that we're pursuing, ch reduces the way that we respond to flagellin, which in many studies has been shown to be beneficial, protective against things like Salmonella typhonarium in mice, which is uh, a relative of typhoid fever causing. And so we start to see that there are these types of 
reactions that we have in malaria, in uh, bacteria flagella, that we're responding to these environmental pressures around us. And as we begin to uncover many adaptive variants, my lab has pursued a number of them, the infectious disease ones are ones that really fascinate us. And one of the ones that was most interesting is uh, gene for um, large, which was critical for a virus called Lassa virus, the strongest signal of selection in the Nigerian population of West Africa we were looking at. Um, and so here's that long haplotype, and it localizes it on this particular gene large. Now, the signal of selection is in Nigeria that we detected. And as it turns out, large is critical for Lassa virus, which was first discovered in Nigeria. Um, it, if you knock out that gene, the virus can't enter because it's important in how the receptor that the virus uses. And what's fascinating is now this was a signal of selection in a, po in a population where this, a virus was you know, discovered and is circulating. And Lassa virus is a hemorrhagic fever causing virus, much like Ebola, uh, kind of a clear driver of evolution. Um, but the problem that I had when we figured this, when we found this, is Lassa fever is described as an emerging disease. So how could something that's described as an emerging disease just recently appearing be driving our ancient evolution? But we, in, in any case, we wanted to try to investigate it. So we set up the ability to begin to investigate this biosafety level four virus that you normally should be happening in very contained settings in these remote regions. Uh, you know, developing research centers with Tulane and our colleagues in Nigeria and Sierra Leone to investigate them. And training also are working closely with our partners in West Africa to really build up the capacity to do this kind of work. We were really interested in it. And what we started to see as we began to look at cases in Nigeria and Sierra Leone is there are many cases of Lassa fever uh, that look like this, the kind of classic hemorrhagic fever that you might expect. But the vast majority of people that were coming in with this deadly virus that had fatality rates in some of our populations of over 50% were coming in looking very innocuous. Their symptoms were really hard to uh, distinguished from malaria and other things. And we said, actually, are there a lot of cases that are going undetected because we don't have the diagnosis in most places to look for it? And in fact, if you look at antibodies, which is a way of seeing if anybody's been exposed to the virus before, there's a lot of evidence that there is widespread seroprevalence or widespread exposure to Lassa within West Africa. And also, as we began to sequence and analyze the, the virus itself, we can actually begin to date the virus and see how long it's been around. And the evidence from just the populations we're looking at is it's over 1,000 years old, and likely much older, because these dates are minimum dates, and we're only looking at a sampling of the population. So we're talking about a virus that's been around for a millennia, and that seems to be spreading pretty widely, but yet we call it an emerging disease, and yet many of you might not have heard about it. I hadn't heard about it myself before I began to investigate it, even though I'd even gone to medical school. It just wasn't really being talked about. So really, it started to say, you know, actually, yes, loss of virus does appear to be ancient and widespread. It may not be emerging. And it led us to a more broad question, which is uh, emerging disease or diagnosis. Are these diseases that we think about as emerging, are they really, really new? Or are we just picking up for the first time these things that have been circulating for a long time? And just as you, know, you think about that, you say, you know, a lot of times when we think about emerging diseases, we think about um, the latter part of the 20th century, the emergence of Marburg in 1967, Lassa in 1969, Ebola in 1976, and HIV in the 80s. And that really led the IOM to, to make this big statement, microbial threats to health in the United States, where they coined the phrase emerging infections. And we think about them as these very visible things that we can pick up on that are coming because of, they're coming out of the forest, they're coming out of nowhere. But we began to believe that actually the true face of emerging diseases are things like this. There are things that are circulating in clinics going undetected. And just as we started thinking about that on a large scale, something happened. In March 2014, uh, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was declared in Guinea. Um, had probably been circulating for months even there before it was detected, but suddenly began to move through Guinea, then Liberia, and, uh, and kind of move through the region. And we, knowing that our collaborators in Sierra Leone and in Nigeria were going to be at the front lines, because if it was, Sierra Leone is very close to Liberia and Guinea on sharing a border, and Nigeria within the region, we knew our collaborators there would be on the front lines. So we immediately set up surveillance for them. Our, our team went out and helped them set up diagnostics for Ebola in March of 2014, and in May, Augustine Goba, our collaborator there, diagnosed the first case in Sierra Leone. Um, and we immediately moved to, uh, we'd had physicians in place for a long time to sequence loss of ours, so we immediately moved to release 99 genomes as, as soon as we got them uh, into the lab uh, and begin to investigate and over time released hundreds of genomes and began to pursue it. And why is it important? I always talk about the fact that infectious diseases, microbes, are some of the most fascinating from an evolutionary standpoint because they're some of the strongest evolutionary pressures on humans, but they themselves evolve. 
And as they evolve, they change in really important ways. And in particular, in the outbreak, the issue is that the diagnostics, the vaccines, the therapies that we're using to uh, combat this are all based on the genome sequence. If it's changing, then, our, then these things may not be as effective. And so we need to be tracking it in real time. We also want to see what variants are emerging in the genome, what's changing about the genome in time. We can use the virus's genome also to trace transmission. We can create a family tree and begin to investigate the relationships between different infections. And one of the things that we saw was that these were very closely related, suggesting a singular transmission into the human population uh, that was passing from human to human since it occurred uh, in, in March of 2014 or, or, or a little bit before. And importantly, I'm not going to talk about it too much because it's unpublished and led by my colleague Jeremy Lubin, but we now have evidence that the virus was not only just mutating, it was actually adapting, that a number of the changes uh, that my group and others, many other groups are beginning to investigate, increase the infectivity of the virus, likely it's also replication rate. This virus is a moving target. And so it's really important that we use all of the techniques at hand to, to attack these as we can. And the last thing I'll just leave you with is this idea going back. So this figure that I showed before as I posed the question of emerging disease or diagnosis was actually from a paper that we published in Science in 2012. And we were talking about Lassa, but this picture actually, and one of the key topics that we were talking about was Ebola. So this is a picture drawn by Stephen Geyer, uh, sort of from a, a picture he had taken over the Congo River where he transformed the Congo River into the shape of the Ebola virus. And back in 2012, we already began to think, is Ebola circulating undetected? Because you look at the seroprevalence and you look at the history of these viruses, they look like they're much more widespread and just going undetected, breeding in these small ways. But if we don't watch out for them, they can escalate. Um, and so this gives you that question. If we look from a different angle, have these viruses been here all along? And are they with us? Um, and with that, I just want to thank the extraordinary number. I, you know, I know this is, I just want to say that all of this is teamwork through extraordinary collaborators that I can't even mention, but just want to show the kind of team spirit that, are, that pursues a lot of this and the great collaborators. Uh, and this is a final picture of my lab's holiday card from last year, uh, just to show what creative, amazing, extraordinary people they are. Thank you. So going, going back to the, uh, the theme earlier about urbanization, uh, as, as these teeming cities of West Africa move into the bush, hmm. is it inevitable we're going to see a repeat of this? I'm talking about Ebola now. Yeah. Well, I mean, th there's a lot of questions about that. Um, the, you know, uh, for the Ebola outbreak, there was, you know, why did it escalate the way it did? And a big part of the reason why folks thought that it escalated was because unlike previous outbreaks that happened in Congo and, and, and DRC and places that are not very populated, now we have a very populated region with people interacting a lot. We have highways that are connected, and so we saw the virus moving between cities. Um, so, you know, both instances going, you know, going into the bush, uh, interacting more with the environment, as well as just interacting more with each other are going to be all these things that are going to create the dynamics. We also saw that the virus probably did mutate, which made it a little bit, uh, you know, all of these things come to play at the same time. And the most important thing is just stopping each outbreak in its tracks before the virus gets a chance to change. Do you think we're better prepared for the next time on that front? Um, we are better prepared, but we are nowhere near where we should be prepared. I would say that there's a lot of understanding that more needs to be done, but we are a very, very long way off. Uh, yeah. All right. All right, thank More you. More on that later. Thank you, Pardis. Thank you. All right.